All right. Let's uh, welcome Yako. He's presenting on laminar filtering, and the others are not here, so it'll be a bit shorter. Thank you. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, Rebecca and uh, Robert are in Cancun, Mexico. So I will do my best to uh, present what we've done. Uh, but the thing is that, is that uh, like our initial aim of this project was to uh, implement alternative algorithms for, for, uh, for commander systems, essentially. So we wanted to do some fairly low level stuff, uh, which uh, turned out to be a bit more difficult <laughs> than we initially anticipated. Uh, but I'll get back to that. But first of all, just to uh, level the thing a little bit, I, I uh, want to uh, just give a brief overview of what collaborative collaborative filtering is about. So uh, say that we have uh, uh, a set of, uh, a data set of uh, ratings or something like that uh, from a lot of users that rated various items and want to use that to recommend new, new items to users. Um, one, uh, 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 then you can like, of course uh, put all this data in a matrix. Uh, if, if, if all the users have rated all items, right? So it would look something like this. But typically that's not the case, right? You have uh, missing entries that you want to, to complete. Uh, you want to complete the matrix by uh, imputing these missing entries. So if you look at this silly toy example, uh, it, would, it would kind of make sense to you know, uh, recommend the uh, uh, user three to uh, I mean, impute it with and, and, uh, rating three for item four here. Uh, or remove it, for instance. I mean, the reason why uh, it's the kind of like sparked uh, yeah. the interest for the research community was because of like it's, it's a large a large attribute that is like Netflix uh, challenge uh, 2015, I think. Uh, so yeah, we will, will sometimes use refer to items as movies because that's a very important <laughs> application of this. Um, but I mean, this is kind of silly, right? Uh, the previous example, but typically we have something that is more like this. Uh, and it might be, I mean, I mean, you can maybe get an idea of what to, what to compute, but, but in general, it's not trivial. So uh, a natural way of approaching this is the uh, matrix accuracy invitation. So uh, you introduce two, uh, two smaller matrices U and V, and uh, you kind of like generate recommendation by looking up in these two tables, uh, Row rows that correspond to user and items, right? So you want to see which, what to rate, oh, sorry, which uh, rating user three, three would uh, rate, uh, say, item four, movie four here. You take the row of the user correspond to user three and uh, the, the row correspond to item five, you and me respectively, and take the product when it gets rated. So, um, so more uh, formally, you want to solve this optimization problem. Uh, so given this matrix, matrix X, which contain all the uh, uh, all the ratings that you have observed, you want to approximate it by uh, U V transpose, but you also remove all the entries that haven't been observed yet. So you make the loss insensitive to all the data points that haven't been observed. Themselves. So this is what these like masking operators do. And uh, to uh, uh, in order to uh, reduce the risk of overfitting and improve uh, the learning process, make a better condition, uh, you have to add the regularizers. Uh, okay, so uh, the standard approach of uh, Solving this problem, approximately, is uh, done by noting that although this problem is non-convex, uh, if you fix uh, one block of variables, say u, then it becomes a least squares problem in b. So, and, uh, so what you do is that you, you alternate between the two variable blocks and solve for respect block uh, until you get some uh, or some sort of convergence. Criteria is is met. Um, so uh, 
Yes, to get you get later. What we're gonna do later and discuss later is that we were like thinking of like okay, how good or bad would it be to instead consider something simpler like gradient based methods for, for these uh, applications that uh, and the gradients are not really actually quite simple to, to compute, is that you just compute the predicted rating uh, for uh, uh, for an observed data point, and then you scale it with a I mean, if you want to compute the gradient for user i, you scale it, you compute this rating and scale it with a, with a corresponding item yeah. item factor, such. So it's, uh, uh, so it's quite simple. Um, by the way, you do this in practice, uh, it's actually uh, not as straightforward as you may think, because um, there are a lot of inter interdependencies uh, between uh, factor blocks here. Uh, so uh, if you have a, a rating matrix on this form, say, and uh, then we consider U and U and these and these form, and say that we have lots of users and a lot of items. So we want to partition uh, the user block and the factor block respectively. Uh, uh, you may want to do something like this, right? But then, uh, if you uh, uh, say that you want to compute the gradients of the users corresponding to this block, then you will need all the uh, all the uh, 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 factors corresponding to the items that these users are rated, right? So you will actually need access to the data points of this particular, all the partition in general, right? So it is inherent, quite very communication intensive. And you will have to do the same thing with these, right? With this, right? So, uh, so one way of uh, at least reducing this communication overhead is by redundancy. So what you do is that you actually create, you actually, yeah, you actually split this RDD twice, or this uh, data set twice, both like row-wise and column-wise. So by doing that, uh, you can, can uh, you have the data corresponding to the users at least in the same partitions, and, the, and, the, and similarly you have the uh, the data corresponding to, to the items in the same partitions in the same in the same partitions. Um, but you will still need to communicate. Uh, but uh, you at least you have to achieve some uh, a lot larger degree of locality by doing this. But another nice approach that ALS is using yeah, here is that they. Uh, I mean, the only factors that are relevant for one, uh, the, the only item factors that are relevant for one user block is um, it's not general all use, use items, because if you take a subset of users, they typically only rate it as a subset of items, right? So, uh, so one way, the way that uh, ALS and, and we handle this is by creating a new uh, RDD which actually uh, tells uh, which, uh, like for these users, which items, which items partition will it actually be important for. So therefore you only communicate the factors that are relevant for each respective partition. Um, so let's see. So I guess that's also the default implementation. Yes. yes. Uh, so just some comments on this optimization problem. Uh, uh, again, I mean, when you fix one block and solve for the other, it's essentially a square problem. And that's the main reason why you want to alternate. Uh, but there are some potential drawbacks here, and that is like the inherent sequential nature of uh, uh, of this alternating schemes. I mean, in order to update you, you must wait until V is updated, right? right. And gradient sent, you do the updates all at once, essentially. So that's, uh, that's one potential drawback. Uh, and uh, a kind of consequence of that is like in, in one iteration, when you need to update both U and V, I mean, you need to exactly kind of like query the data set twice, right? So, and that's the, the, that's the yeah. expensive part. So uh, our idea was like, okay, why, why not consider a gradient-based uh, approach instead? Uh, but there are some other drawbacks that you will have to consider them. 
I mean, first of all, it's non-convex, so the convergence might be heavily affected by it. Uh, if you don't, don't uh, calibrate, if you don't handle it in the proper way. And moreover, uh, the problem isn't even uh, the gradients of the problems aren't even really yeah. smooth, uh, which is like the most basic assumption that you make when you uh, analyze first order methods. Uh, uh, and um, but there is a paper that we wanted to uh, what was it? Was it we wanted to implement, uh, which accounts for this. Uh, 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 non L smoothness essentially by uh, by using a method called Bregman proxy gradient descent and uh, one like very superficial so motivation behind this is like when you consider gradient descent like you don't update uh, variables with the gradient of the, the scale scale gradient of the uh, of the current iterate I mean you can see this as you're solving uh, a local model of your objective. Which is a linearization plus a quadratic, essentially. Uh, and this uh, quadratic is is, uh, is majorizing for your objective if you have L smooth. Uh, if it's not L smooth, uh, this won't in yeah. general be L, uh, won't in general be majorizing, and hence you cannot ensure that you have like sufficient descent, for instance. So what Bregman descent is doing then is like you replace this quadratic proximity term with uh, a Bregman divergence instead, uh, and uh, then you can handle more problems because you don't need Lipschitz smoothness anymore. You just need that it's so-called uh, L smart, which is like L smooth uh, adaptive ish. Uh, uh, so it's like a kind of a generalization of it. Uh, so uh, in this paper, they actually prove that by choosing uh, H here, which is like a kernel generating function associated with a break by uh, divergence uh, on this form, which contains higher order terms, essentially. Uh, Could you briefly tell us what Bergman divergence is again? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a um, chalk form, I think. With, uh, Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. H of X. I have the Oh, and that's just the light. Uh, can you use greater more force when you write on the board? Yeah. Okay. And it's more, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Right. Might make more noise. Too. These are h of x. What is h of x minus um, h of y plus the gradient uh, times one? So this is essentially a uh, how H deviates from the total linear approximation. Yeah. Yeah. So typically, you wanna, if, if H there is, um, if H is uh, strongly convex, then um, the divergence. Zero. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's not, not it's, uh, symmetric in general, and it's uh, not even sure if it's built a triangle in general, so it's not a distance. But I mean, the, point, the, point, the most important example of this is when H is the sum of entropy, because then you get a cool and vector divergence. And uh, Maybe some of you have seen uh, mirror descent algorithm. Yeah, this is actually the generalization of it. So the break the Bregman descent algorithm is mirror descent. That HB. So then you're like, you're like this like uh, proximity term here. Yeah, it's the Kullback cool divergence. 
Um, so yeah, we, uh, it should be 2019, right? but anyways, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I found this uh, paper quite interesting and I want to implement it. Uh, and uh, they also use acceleration to fix for this for this. And this column check it and make it 2019. So they have like a heavy ball loop term there. So they merge with part four. Yeah, something like that. Okay, uh, so this was our goal, but we didn't quite uh, get there to be honest, <laughs> because we uh, uh, encountered many different, I mean, a lot of different uh, challenges on the way, uh, which is a bit uh, frustrating to be honest, but, um, but first of all, we wanted to use as much as possible from the, the plug tail filtering package. I mean, like uh, interfaces, uh, uh, object X, like the recommend, 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 uh, like the rating objects, for instance. Um, but the problem is that uh, more or less everything in uh, MLib, but also in Spark in general, all the utils, etc., etc., in, in the package, are all the all the mod, all the all the pack, all the fu uh, functions and the classes are private to the respective sub packages, right? So uh, you can't import it unless you you work in the same package, or and the consequence of that would be that you actually compile Spark locally every time when you want to do it, your own package. But um, we also found another uh, another project that did something similar, but it was based on a really old Spark version, so we can uh, polish that quite early on. But uh, yeah. A week ago, so we find this like hack that you can still access. I'm not sure it's the way you should interact with the with the uh, with the um, with the MLib uh, uh, package if you want to code something yourself. But uh, um, but just by like just by uh, calling your package, uh, I mean having the same prefix essentially as. Uh, Set of packages in Spark, then you can actually access the private packages, although you haven't compiled, although you compile it individually. You get a few warnings uh, in the, for the compiler, though, but it still works. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, me and Rob, Robert, as actually uh, from this part, we considered different approaches because I wanted to do everything locally. Uh, uh, and install the other package later with a jar file on the uh, on the cluster, uh, but it's uh, it wasn't in a sufficiently stable set to stable to motivate you know restarting the structure the cluster uh, while you were working on it essentially. So yeah, um, and we got a crash course on how to use like uh, uh, Docker and, and SPT build and all of this over one of the lunches. <laughs> and also, it's a non-trivial task, right? Because this was for it's what uh, on one point three. And this library was released by the yeah, uh, this one, the one you were trying to. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, they were using like a conjugate, get, conjugate gradient net support. So there were like a lot of stuff that we could use for that. But yeah, that was a really old project. Uh, and it was much easier to interact with our Spark in that version because there were a lot of other packages that weren't private, such. Uh, but, anyways, uh, so what Robert did was he was actually to write the package in the. Uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, in the Databricks notebook, so yeah, it's a lot of because back it's, it's settled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, but I mean it works. <laughs> uh, uh, but the thing is, is that it's. Um, I mean, we we wanted to like do this incrementally, right? So it's a. Uh, so we want just to start simple, just create and send, and then later, generalize it to. Because essentially, when you want to solve this subproblem yeah. uh, that involves the fragment, that specific fragment proximity term, I mean, it's very similar to gradient descent. It's just that you more dynamically choose your step size, which is like dependent on uh, on the uh, on the norm of the uh, of the uh, of the factors. Uh, so, um, 
So, I mean, there's a lot of code, but I think that the, the stuff that uh, most relevant to point out here is that we, we, I mean, by you doing this, you're doing it in this way, we can use a lot of, uh, we can use this partition that we discussed in the first slide, the single by the less. Um, so here you partition the, uh, uh, the data uh, uh, based on the, uh, the user and the item server. Uh, uh, the user is yeah, the item server, so you get the tickets. Uh, and by that, you create this user in blocks, user out blocks, and items in blocks, and, use, and item item out blocks. So, user in block is, uh, uh, is contain all the ratings for uh, what is partition based on, based on users, and this one is partition based on items. Right? So, you have the actual documents. Yeah, I just want to remind everyone like, if you want to set something in a way that you want to do, right? The custom partitioner in Spark, in Scala or in Python, is the way to go. And it's already a solid or mm -hmm. commercially industrial strength package. Yeah. Go on. Uh, and it's like out blocks are uh, <laughs> the ones that are pointing at you, which, which items are actually relevant for various partitions. Uh, and then, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, yeah, right. So then, then when you want to <clears throat> uh, get all the data that is relevant for for each partition, user, user partition, then, then you can then you can use this uh, like flat map operation essentially, and you take take all the uh, uh, you take all the uh, the relevant indices here uh, by taking by using the uh, by taking it up on this uh, output position, and when um, uh, uh, and, and then you can essentially get all the data you need by a, a join in the end. Uh, uh, so uh, here is like if they find find the updated item factors to uh, you use this join, and we do you essentially uh, do the gradients updates. Yeah. But then you have all the data you need for the gradients uh, available. Uh, and uh, so yeah, here are the, the updated dates and. Uh, and we did some experiments there with some simple RDVs, but there were some problems that we encountered with the result of the grade. Uh, and that is because we can't really run uh, that many iterations because in uh, in uh, in ALS, to uh, cut like the lineage of your, uh, I mean, if you want to just run say hundreds of iterations, I mean, it's like a dog that is very great by all the actions. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a ridiculous lot, right? So what you do is that you check point after like say 10 iterations. But the nice thing about ALS yeah. is that since the user block is completely dependent on the item block, you only need to checkpoint the user block. But in the forgetting sense, you need to check the checkpoint both. And uh, for some reason, we couldn't really make that work in time. <laughs> so uh, so we couldn't really resolve uh, the checkpointing, and hence it was quite difficult to scale up uh, for many iterations. Uh, and also, that's exactly the problem if you use graph frames and don't set checkpoint directly, the lineage graphs would blow up, right? All the iterations would. So, so some of you who are doing graph frames, you didn't do the set checkpoint directory, so that all of those checkpointing would be automatically handled by the graph frames package, then things may be slow. Right? Yeah. But I think I'll end there. Uh, okay. <laughs> So I have a question. Uh, I have written to the OWASP program office to keep this running, this, this resource running. Uh, and we're waiting from AWS for credits. Uh, and if it happens before the end of the month, then we're set up for good, right? We're like 1,500 or 3,000 US dollars or something. And if you don't, then I warn the WASP program office that they may have to pay Databricks, the AWS bill, okay? And my argument is that this may be good for some of you to push it a bit further, turn it into some conference proceedings or whatever you want, right? And in Jakob's case, I mean, this is almost like, a, I, mean, I mean, this is a package basically with enough time, which could be turned into it. And also several other speakers, right? Uh, Manu and Jack. Again, so 
So the question is, um, and this kind of stuff will be interesting to this um, conference uh, uh, that would be good to go to also in addition to academic conferences. Um, uh, can, can you open a tab and search for this? Um, data plus AI. Uh, I think there should be a Europe version coming up. Uh, yeah, Data AI Summit 2022, maybe? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. So, that, so there'll be, oh, sorry, we wrote 2023, sorry. So there will be this sequence happening both in, in North America and also in Europe. And I think pretty soon it will also be happening in Asia. I recommend this is because, um, you know, you get very clever people coming, but also from industry, like, you know, and, and it, it's it's quite a lot of stuff. Um, and there, if you present it, you will also get uh, some other experience, right? And um, so, so if you want to do that, that or go to any other academic conference, it doesn't matter. The question is, would, would can you raise your hand if you would like this resource to keep running thing for all of December? Like all these clusters, the shards. Is there anyone interested in possibly using it for a few more weeks? Okay. No one's interested. Okay, so I will get eliminated at the at the time of the end of the peer review. And your books will um yeah, so there is instructions for peer review. That was, that was another um, confusion. So Actually, um, I think I would be interested in launching some experience. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, uh, I mean, because a lot of lot of the work you've done, it's it's very close to like a conference paper, right? But then you have to set this up on some other other infrastructure, which I would. I mean, it's there. So okay, if one is interested, okay, then I'm going to leave it. Just be careful and don't don't. Don't like blow the budget by having eight GPUs or anything like that. Um, the other thing, oh, so maybe we should stop the recording. The, the other thing I should point out is how to uh, how to pass the course. Um, 